Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'd like to, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David uh, Harrison, uh, who's a, a professor at um, uh, Swarthmore College. He's also, uh, associate, excuse me, associate professor at Swarthmore College. He's also uh, a member of the Enduring uh, Voices Project, which is a uh, uh, joint initiative with the National Geographic Society. And as many of you know, he was a, uh, the co-star of the film uh, The Linguists, which if you have not seen The Linguists, it's really worth a watch. It's a very uh, moving uh, and uh, 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 impressive uh, uh, one-hour uh, movie. Um, uh, he's done extensive uh, field work, uh, I think emphasis on extensive, uh, uh, for uh, various endangered and threatened languages around the world, um, from Siberia, Mongolia, Bolivia, India, um, uh, in the Americas, uh, just uh, virtually every continent. Um, he's author of a number of books uh, in the mainstream press, uh, one of which, uh, When Languages Die, if we have a copy over there, uh, and also The Last Speakers, which has just come out. And he's author of a number of grammars uh, for threatened and endangered languages, uh, as well as a number of uh, linguistic papers uh, on the, the same languages. Um, so again, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Harrison. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me and hosting me here. It's been a really uh, great experience, my first visit to Microsoft. And I've spent uh, yesterday and today just getting familiar with some of the work that's going on here. And I have to say it's really quite impressive what Microsoft is doing with respect to language localization and uh, producing software and access in um, 100 or more languages uh, providing ways that will seed innovation and creativity. And these are the kind of efforts that I want to endorse as someone who's concerned with language diversity. And um, I'm going to be talking today about some of the world's smallest and most endangered languages. But many of, the, um, many of the situations that I'm going to be talking about are common to a larger set of languages that I would call emerging languages. Um, some of which are included in Microsoft's initiatives. So these are languages that may have hundreds of thousands or even up into the millions of speakers, but have very little presence on the internet, haven't yet crossed what we call the digital divide. Um, so I would welcome uh, comments and questions on that topic as well. Um, I'm going to be talking today about endangered languages, global and local trends. Uh, this talk has some scientific content, but it's also intended for a general audience. And again, I would welcome any questions or discussions you may have. I want to give you two views on the topic of endangered languages. So the global trend comes from my own research of over a decade as a scientist visiting hundreds of communities around the world and trying to understand why languages are going extinct what's happening with global linguistic diversity, and trying to amass evidence for why this matters, how this affects all of us if we lose linguistic diversity in the world. This is a photograph from um, one of my field sites in Western Mongolia, um, a very small minority people called the Monchak. And in this photograph, they are reading a dictionary which I wrote for their language, and they're seeing their language in a book for the first time. So this is a very powerful metaphor for how new technologies, uh, whether it's uh, books or writing or cell phones or computers, can really be used to help sustain small languages. Um, the local perspective I will give you comes from my encounters with people like this who are last speakers of languages. And I think their stories are very powerful and very important, so I want to bring those to you as well. Many of you probably know this already, but generally I find when you tell people that there are about 7,000 languages in the world, uh, most people, including most well-educated people, are surprised at this number. They haven't heard this number before. And a second typical reaction people have is, why didn't I know this before? 
Uh, this seems like a, a very basic fact about the world that your fifth grade geography teacher uh, could have told you. And so we're not really aware in terms of the general public of how much linguistic diversity exists in the world. So I want to talk a little bit today about where linguistic diversity is distributed, uh, where it's under threat, where languages are going extinct, and why languages are going extinct. This number, 7,000, I use for convenience. If you look in the ethnologue, which is the state-of-the-art listing of the world's languages, uh, it lists 6,920, I think, in the current edition. I use 7,000. I'm convinced that 7,000 is, is also an undercount for reasons I can go into a little bit later. There are many languages out there that haven't yet been noticed or identified or counted by scientists. And so even as the world's languages are going through an extinction crisis, the number of listed languages, paradoxically, is increasing each year as we notice languages that we never noticed before. If you were to look at a world map with 7,000 dots, and the, the resolution isn't great here because many of the dots are layered on top of each other, but uh, you could zoom in to any of these areas. And one of the first patterns that you would notice is that the world's language are geographically very unevenly distributed. So we have areas with very high concentrations of many languages. I'll just point out Papua New Guinea over here, which has something like 800 languages in a very, very small space. Um, and areas that may be densely populated, like this part of Asia, have relatively few languages. So the world's languages are very unevenly distributed geographically. We have clusters of very high diversity and areas of relatively low diversity. And I'll talk in a little bit about how we want to define linguistic diversity. What are the actual scientific criteria for saying what linguistic diversity is? Is some of that a side effect of being hard to explore some of those regions? Like there might be a lot of languages there, we just don't know. Um, yes, part of that is a function of uh, geography. Uh, places that haven't been well studied by outsiders may have a diversity of languages that we, we haven't yet begun to appreciate. A place like Sudan, for example, uh, a place like Papua New Guinea. Uh, there are many, many parts of the world where we have virtually no scientific descriptions of the languages that are there or even a complete list of the languages that are there. And I'll be talking about some of those areas. This is, in fact, one of those areas, um, Arunachal Pradesh, which is the extreme northeastern state of India bordering on Bhutan. Uh, we do not have a full list of the languages that are spoken in that area. Those of you who speak a second language uh, are already very familiar with this notion, but it's worth repeating for the general public. Um, different languages are not just a case of using different words or different sounds to say the same thing. Uh, languages can differ quite radically in the way that they package information, in the way that they have abstract concepts, the way that they direct people's attention to certain aspects of the world. Um, those of you who are bilingual will be familiar with the translation paradox, where you have a, something that is a perfectly coherent concept in one language, and you simply cannot render it direct word for word into another language that you may know equally well. And so languages differ greatly. Because we, we haven't yet managed to document most of the world's languages, we really don't know what the possible space of variation is among languages. We have an inkling of it, but we don't know what it is yet. I mentioned that I want to give you the local perspective. And over the past decade, I've traveled around interviewing hundreds of individuals who are what I would call linguistic survivors, the very last speakers of a language that is going to go extinct. And so I would like to share their personal perspective with you uh, as part of my talk today. I'll start by playing a brief video clip uh, of a woman named Hannah Cooper from South Africa. And in her own words, what does it feel like to be a linguistic survivor? Uh, 
So what does it matter if Mu or languages like it go extinct if they go to sleep? Uh, whatever metaphor you may prefer to use to talk about this process of languages disappearing. Uh, does it really have any consequence for the rest of us? Should we really care if a few elderly ladies uh, in South Africa stop speaking this language? What is lost? I want to give you some concrete arguments today about the human knowledge base and the types of things that we are losing that we don't even know what they are really, uh, but that really will affect all of us negatively. Um, I start by pointing out that we all have a particular bias by virtue of the fact that we all live in an information economy. We all have been raised in highly literate, word-oriented societies. And so we have what I call a literacy bias, which means that we tend to think that any information that's useful uh, is written down somewhere, right? It can be Googled or binged. Uh, you can find it in a database, in a library. In fact, uh, this is not the case. Most of the world's languages have never been written down or make no use of literacy. They're not found in any libraries or databases. And so it follows from that that most of what people know, uh, most of the human knowledge base, is not written down. It's transmitted just orally from mouth to ear. It is socially distributed. It is stored only in people's memories. Um, but we can learn a lot from these cultures, from oral cultures, because they have solved some really difficult information transfer problems. They've figured out how to transmit vast bodies of knowledge uh, across the generations, knowledge that contributed to their survival, um, knowledge that may be, in some cases, more precise than what science knows. Um, and they've done it all without the benefit of outsourcing technologies like writing or computers. So I think we have a lot to learn from these societies, which are strictly oral. My job as a linguist, and I always work with part of a team, um, so here's a picture of our National Geographic team in Paraguay. Um, this is uh, linguist uh, Greg Anderson. Uh, we have an anthropologist, Ana Luisa Daño, um, a videographer, Alejandro Chascalberg, uh, this is a local indigenous leader, um, Chris Pilo Martinez, myself. We're sitting in a small village in the Chaco region of Paraguay. We're interviewing an elder. His name is Basso. Um, he's 100 years old. And this man has fascinating stories to tell. It's an absolute privilege to go and to sit at the feet of someone like this and to have him share his knowledge with us. He personally remembers a time when his people lived as hunter-gatherers in a remote desert region. They had no knowledge of metal, of glass, of outsiders, of guns. They acquired all of their nutrition from hunting and foraging activities. And now he lives in a village where they have televisions, they have mobile phones, they have airplanes, they have visiting teams of scientists from National Geographic flying in. So think of the stages that are compressed into a single lifetime that this man has experienced. He has amazing stories to tell. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to hear these stories, to record them, and through the medium of film, the internet, public lectures like this one, to bring his stories to a global audience. I mentioned before that the world's languages are geographically very unevenly distributed. And I want to point out now that they are also demographically very unevenly distributed. So I have two pyramids here. On the left is a pyramid representing the world's languages, approximately 7,000. On the right, a population pyramid. And you can see here that the 83 big languages spoken in the world map onto something like 80% of the world's population. So those are the big languages. We're all familiar with what those are. Um, in the middle, there's a group of languages ranging from millions of speakers, perhaps even tens of millions of speakers, down to, say, about 10,000 speakers. And that's about 3,000 languages. That maps onto something like 20% of the world's population. And at the base of the language pyramid, we have the majority of the world's languages, more than 3,500 languages. Those are spoken by just 0.2% of the world's population. So this is a very skewed distribution of linguistic diversity, of knowledge that is contained in language. And this slide is just a snapshot today of what is an accelerating trend. So if we were to look at this again in 10 years, the proportions would be even more skewed than they are now. So I definitely feel a sense of urgency. We're looking at the trends. We're looking at languages going extinct, maybe as rapidly as one every two weeks or so. 
and um, we're really scrambling. There's not enough people working on this problem. Many people have made a comparison between species extinction and language extinction. I prefer to think of these as parallel extinction processes, but there's some interesting connections between them. So I just want to point out what some of the connections are between language extinction and species extinction. And the first connection or comparison that I would make is that languages are much more endangered than species. So even if you add up all the endangerment percentages for types of animals and plants, um, languages are more endangered. A second comparison I would make is that we are in a similar state of scientific knowledge for languages as we are for species. So if you talk to a biologist, they will tell you that something like 80% of the plant and animal species that exist on Earth have not yet been identified, taxonomized, named within a Western scientific framework. So for biologists, the whole biosphere is sitting out there basically waiting to be noticed. Um, in linguistics, uh, we have a similar problem in that not more than 20 percent and probably significantly less than that of the world's languages have been adequately documented. That means we have a grammar, we have a dictionary, we have a corpus of recordings so that if the speakers vanish tomorrow we would have some idea what the language was like. So we're in a similar state of scientific knowledge for languages and species. A third connection I would point out is that much of what people know about the natural world, what people know about plants and animals, is knowledge that is only contained in small and endangered languages. Nisi Achane Max Chura Mamane Kayawaya Chari Nisi Sekane Kai Sikuman Pacha Kuchaita Seho. That was uh, Ilarion Zamos Kondori from Bolivia. He's a speaker of the Kalawaya language. Kalawaya is estimated to have about 100 speakers. Um, those of you who saw the film The Linguist, there was a segment where we visited the Kalawaya. Kalawaya culture is famous for its knowledge of medicinal plants. So they have spent centuries walking the length and breadth of South America collecting plants and experimenting on those plants to extract their medicinal properties, their curative properties. They knew, for example, about quinine as an antimalarial long before Europeans did. They have an immense pharmacological knowledge base, which they have encoded in Kalawaya. Kalawaya is for them considered a secret language, and it's a way of protecting that knowledge. These kinds of examples can be multiplied many times over. Any indigenous culture that you care to visit around the world will have a deep and sophisticated knowledge of the local plants and animals, the local environment, uh, knowledge that often exceeds what science knows about that environment. And I'll give you some more examples of that today. Uh, I'll just say there's a famous debate in linguistics about whether or not the Eskimo have many words for snow. How many of you are familiar with this? So uh, this has gone back and forth over the years. Um, um, for it was perhaps exaggerated out of proportion by some scholars and then other scholars came along and said no they don't have a lot of words for snow and even if they did it wouldn't be particularly interesting. Uh, well I want to debunk uh, both of those points of view by saying that um, they do have lots of words for things that occur in their environment. Uh, there's a book about the Yupik knowledge of uh, weather and ice. Uh, the Yupik live in Alaska and it lists 99 distinct terms for different types of sea ice formations. And each of those terms is accompanied by a detailed drawing and description. And what that UPIC sea ice terminology tells them, among other things, is under what meteorological conditions do this type of ice form? What are its characteristics, its texture, its color? Is it good for walking on, for hunting? What kinds of animals appear with it? What other kinds of seasonal indications appear with it? This is a detailed knowledge base about something that we are actually losing right now, that is the Arctic ice. And so this is a culture that has expertise in that area that we should value. And again, these examples can be multiplied many times over with any culture you care to look at. This leads to what I call the triple threat of extinction. So we're all familiar with the problem of animals and ecosystems being under threat. Um, less well known are the fact that languages are going extinct and I'm trying to raise public awareness about that. But even less well known than that is the idea that knowledge systems 
about species and ecosystems that are contained in small languages are going extinct. So we're losing both the knowledge about how to live sustainably on the planet at the same time that we're losing these environments. I want to take you now to a place where I've done many years of field work that's very dear to my heart, which is central Siberia. Uh, has anyone here been to Siberia? Well, I want to recommend it to you. It's culturally a very rich place. You can go in the summer when it's not cold. Um, and this is a speaker, Marta Kangarayeva, that I've spent several years working with. And she shared a lot of her knowledge with me. And I want to use her as a, an example of what types of knowledge systems are eroding. Marta's people are called the Tofa people. They're uh, very small in number, probably 500. Uh, only about 25 people speak the language. So their language is in severe decline. And she's a lifelong hunter, reindeer herder. She knows everything about the Siberian forest ecosystem. And so I began to notice specific types of knowledge that Marta has in her language. Uh, for one thing, um, the Tofa elders have an incredibly detailed mental map of their territory. Every single topographic and geographic feature is named down to a level of detail that exceeds what you could see on a kind of satellite view or in an atlas. So they have a very detailed map of their territory. Um, they have a lunar calendar uh, with 13 months that was m more precise than our solar calendar. It correlated various events in the natural world to the, um, the moon and the sun. And when I say more precise, I mean our solar calendar gets out of sync every four years. It gets out of sync by an entire day, which is why we have February 29th. Their calendar resets itself every year, so it never gets that far out of sync. Um, this is disappearing. Um, and the way that I know this knowledge dis is disappearing, that I've talked to multiple generations of the Tofa people. So I've talked to Marta's son, Sergei Kongarayev, who is also a hunter and a reindeer herder. Um, he's what I would call a passive speaker of the Tofa language. That is, he can understand what his mother's saying. Um, he can utter a word or two, but he can't really put together complex thoughts or sentences in the language. This is a common scenario in language shift. Um, and so you see the knowledge eroding, and if you talk to the next generation, Sergei's children, Marta's grandchildren, um, you find that they're reduced to almost no knowledge of their parents' language. This community has shifted over almost entirely to speaking Russian, so this generation are monolingual speakers of Russian. And one of the other things that they've lost besides the calendar system and the topographic system is very detailed knowledge of reindeer. They're reindeer herders. Uh, they have developed technologies, survival technologies. Uh, they know how to domesticate reindeer, how to breed them successfully, how to use them as transportation. Uh, they have a very intricate system for classifying reindeer. So if you think about reindeer for a second, um, what are some of the ways that you would want to classify reindeer? Male, Male or female? Uh -huh. Age. Age. Uh -huh. Good. Any other ideas? Like a, a bull, you know, like a breeding member. A breeding bull? Uh -huh. Yeah. No, just bull or ox. Bull or ox. Uh -huh. So there are many ways you could classify them by their color, their size, their pattern. Uh, the Tofa have a four-dimensional, four-parameter system for classifying reindeer. So any reindeer can be classified according to its age, so you were right, um, according to its sex, according to its fertility, uh, which means if it's male, is it, has it been castrated or is it used for breeding stock? Um, for a female, that means has it given birth to offspring yet? Um, so age, sex, fertility, and the last criterion is rideability uh, because they use their reindeer, they don't eat their reindeer, they use them for hunting, for transportation. So that sets up a four-dimensional matrix, and what the language does is it assigns a unique label to every possible combination, every box in that matrix. So if a TOFA speaker says Adair, that means a four-year-old, male, uncastrated, rideable, domesticated reindeer. Now, that's not a completely unique concept. You can express it in English. I just did, but notice what English doesn't provide us with which is a single label that packages all of that knowledge into one word. And this is the, really the power of a taxonomy, of a hierarchical organization of knowledge and packaging that. And this is what languages do best. They package the 
locally ecologically relevant knowledge into ways that are useful to the speakers. They are adaptive systems. And this is precisely what gets flattened out, what gets eroded, what is not translatable when people switch over to speaking a, local, uh, a global language. Um, I want to zoom out now, and we will come back to Siberia in a few minutes, but I want to zoom out and give you a bit more of a global perspective. Uh, a couple years ago, I felt that um, linguistics had a bit of a PR problem. People don't necessarily know what linguistics are or what linguist, linguists do. Uh, I know some of the linguists in the room here may, may agree with me on that. You often have to explain what it is you do as a linguist. Um, and I also felt that the language extinction crisis wasn't really getting the attention that it deserved. I felt that we needed a powerful promotional metaphor to help people grasp this global trend. So I borrowed the idea of hotspots, um, and I came up with the notion of language hotspots. Um, I borrowed this from conservation biodiversity. They have a notion of biodiversity hotspots, which many of you will have heard of, which identifies those regions around the world that have the highest concentrations of endangered endemic species. Now, for languages, the criteria are somewhat different, but I'll, and I'll explain in a moment how we identify a language hotspot. I just wanted to show you the front end to the website. This is hosted at National Geographic, and you can go to um, www.languagehotspots.org, and you can visit this site. It's interactive. You can zoom in and visit the hotspots. Um, so far, we've identified about two dozen language hotspots around the globe, and working with National Geographic, we're visiting as many of them as we can. We are taking the pulse of some of the smallest languages found in those hotspots, making high-quality recordings of the last speakers, um, collecting numbers on the vitality of the language, the numbers of speakers, and so forth, and also supporting efforts at language revitalization, which I'll talk about shortly. This is a version of the hotspots map showing a selection of 13 different hotspots. This appeared in National Geographic magazine in 2007 as our way to launch the concept of a language hotspot. Uh, it's very much a work in progress. We are continually identifying new hotspots. We are expanding existing hotspots. And at the moment, our coverage of the world is quite good. Uh, our identified hotspots do contain about half of the world's languages. And so that correlates well with the pyramid diagram that I showed you before. And of course, there are endangered languages outside of the hotspots, and we don't want to detract attention from that. But this is a way to focus and prioritize resources as well. I'll just show you uh, the top five hotspots here. They happen to be um, northern Australia, eastern Siberia, central South America, Oklahoma and the Southwest and Northwest Pacific Plateau. So we're sitting in a language hotspot right now. Um, you may notice uh, a pattern here, a geographic pattern. The, the top four hotspots fall out at the four corners of the Pacific. Um, they have something else in common, which is a historical trend, if you think about colonization patterns. So Siberia was colonized from the west to the east by Europeans. North America was colonized from the east to the west. Australia was colonized from the south to the north. South America was colonized from the lowlands to the highlands. So these are all essentially residual zones. All of these continents had immense linguistic diversity before colonization. These are the zones where the diversity is still left, and much of the rest of it has already disappeared. How do we decide what constitutes a hotspot? We're interested not just in the sheer number of languages when we say language diversity, but actually in a large number of language families. Uh, many of you would be familiar with the notion of a language family. That would be something like the Romance languages, the Germanic languages, the Slavic languages. Those are all sister languages. In the case of Romance, all descended from Latin. They form a, a unit, and we use that unit to calculate linguistic diversity. So, uh, a hotspot can have a relatively low number of languages, like the Eastern Siberia hotspot only has 23 languages, but it has nine distinct language families. Those 23 languages are so different from each other, they fall into nine families. So that gives it a very high score on the diversity index. Uh, the Northern and Central Australia hotspot has 153 languages divided into 62 language families. Again, scores very high on diversity. So we look first at the level of diversity counting numbers of language families. The second criterion we look at is what we call the endangerment index. And there are various 
scales for rating the relative vitality or endangerment of a language. We look not just at the sheer numbers of speakers, but at the transmission rates, what percentage of children are learning the language as their first language. Uh, and so we can assign languages a score on the endangerment index. And the third criterion is what we call the research index. So how well has this language been documented? How well is it known to science? And that's, a, of course, a qualitative measure. Where you have a convergence, very high diversity, very high endangerment, very low levels of scientific documentation, you have a potential language hotspot. And we've identified two dozen so far. There are some surprises that emerge when you apply the hotspots model globally. And I'm using Bolivia here to illustrate that. Uh, Bolivia, of course, is not um, twice as big as Europe. It's actually quite a small South American country with a small population. But I've made it twice as big on this slide to show you that it has more than twice the linguistic diversity of all of Western Europe. So Europe has uh, 164 languages. These fall into 18 language families. Bolivia has 37 languages, but also has 18 language families. Something else that makes Bolivia a hotspot, um, that you, those of you who are familiar with Basque, which is spoken in Europe, um, can someone tell me why Basque is special? Isn't it uh, related to a secessionist movement in that area? Uh, well, yes, there's a political secessionist movement, but that's not what makes it's it special. Isolated. It's unrelated to any of these. Yeah, it's an isolate language. It's unrelated to any other known language. So it's a family of one. So if Basque were to go extinct, we would lose all knowledge about entire, an entire family of languages. Uh, Bolivia has three Basques. It has three languages that are isolates, that are unrelated to anything else. And unlike Basque, which is doing quite well, uh, these are all very small and endangered languages. So you, applying our hotspots model, Bolivia would be a very high priority for this kind of study and for supporting language revitalization. Uh, I want to come back to Siberia again. I mentioned that the Language Hotspots website is interactive, so I'm going to actually take you, we're going to zoom in and visit the Central Siberian Language Hotspot. If you mouse over it, you get a little pop-up box. You see a picture of Anna and Alexei Baidashev. They're the last uh, remaining married couple in the world who speak their language, the Chulim language, on a daily basis at home. It's the language of their household. All the other speakers of Chulim reside in households where they're the only speakers, so they don't have an opportunity to have conversation. And you can visit the website and see audio and video clips. We're just going to zoom in now and take a map view of it. This is a sort of a political map view of the Central Siberian language hotspot. It's a vast area, but Demographically, it's quite compact, and all of these languages have been in long-term contact with each other for centuries. So each language is represented by a yellow point and a pink polygon, and they cluster together, and most of them are endangered. In fact, they're all endangered. Um, this is um, a map view, and you can see the yellow boxes where the Chulin people are located. Notice that it's about as far from the ocean as you can get anywhere on Earth. It's extremely remote. It's not on the way to anywhere. If you go in here, you go all the way in here to the place where the Chulim people live, and then if you were to draw a line north up to the North Pole, nobody else lives in between them and the North Pole. So they live very remotely, and this is part of what has protected their language. As you zoom in a bit more, you start to see the contours of central Siberia. It's very watery. It's very marshy. It sits on top of permafrost. It has lots of lakes and rivers very green in the summertime. And here is an even closer view of the Chulim River. Each of the yellow boxes represents the location of a speaker of the language. So I not only interview all the speakers of Chulim, but I've taken a GPS fix on them so I can actually plot out the exact footprint of the language. I know how many speakers there are, who they are, where they live, and more importantly, what they have to say. And one of our components of our research project was to actually transport Chulim elders from one village to the other for the purpose of having a conversation, something that we take completely for granted. But it was such a novelty to them. They were so delighted. And in some cases, they didn't even know each other prior to our research project. So we would bring elders from villages, village to village, bring them together in a central location, banish from the room anyone who didn't speak the language, who was a Russian speaker 
and have them just sit down and talk about things that were important to them. And they were very generous in allowing us to observe these conversations. So we're going to listen in now on three of the remaining eight speakers of Chulim. This is Vasya, Ivan, and Anna. Ivan has passed away since we made this recording. Uh, we're going to listen in on a little conversation they had. So Anna does this gesture of forgetting. They really were struggling to try to remember the, the 13 lunar months. They knew that they used to know it. They knew that their parents knew it. It used to be something crucial for survival in their culture. They simply can't remember it. This is the, the erosion of an entire knowledge system. And uh, this is really all that's left of the language. So we've videotaped and recorded hundreds of conversations like this one. There will never be any more, any new stuff in this language. It's, it's sad, but this is sometimes the state that we find the world's smallest languages in. So what happens to a little conversation like this? I can show it to an audience like you. I can bring it back to my laboratory, do all kinds of analysis on it. This is a kind of scientist's view of the language. I've got the video here. I've got the audio signal. I've got the time code that links them together. I can do multiple levels of annotation, so I can do a phonetic transcription here on the first tier. I can do amorphous syntactic analysis where I break down every word into its component parts and identify their functions. I can do an English translation or a Russian translation. This is the kind of thing I do, I train my students to do. But again, this is very much a scientist's view of language. This view of the language has almost no interest or utility to the native speakers themselves who own the language. Yes, they're all speakers of Russian as well. They're bilingual. And typically, in an endangered language community, everyone's bilingual. And their children and grandchildren speak exclusively Russian. They're monolingual speakers. So they haven't spoken their language for, some of them just haven't spoken this language for a long time, right? That's right. They haven't spoken the language on a daily or regular basis for a long time. It undergoes what we call attrition. They begin to forget things. It's difficult for them to call things up. Uh, but they're still very conversant and they can tell jokes and tell stories in the language and they enjoy speaking it when they have the opportunity. So we want to do something more than just go in somewhere and grab some data, make some recordings and bring it back to a lab and organize it. As ethical scientists, um, and I know Microsoft as a corporation doesn't want to just produce software to make money, they want to do things that affect social change. And so this is, in the spirit of that, uh, we try to assess what is it that the community would like? What's their vision for their language? Do they have ideas for maintaining or revitalizing their language? What are those ideas and how can we support them? In the case of the Chulim, the Chulim Tribal Council had a very specific request for us. They asked us to produce a storybook in the language. Now their language had never been written before, but Vasya Gabov, who's the youngest speaker of the language, he was 56 at the time we filmed this video, he had actually invented his own method for writing the language using Russian letters combined in a very clever way. And he was able to write the language and other people were able to read it. So we took his orthography exactly as it was. And we took some of the traditional stories. All their stories are about hunting. Um, they're, they talk about bears and moose and hunting and fishing. Took some of those stories and we turned them into the first Chulim book. We had it illustrated by local children. This is not going to save the language, this little booklet with their stories in it, but it can do something to contribute to the prestige of the language. And the prestige of the language is that intangible factor that makes people decide to keep a language or not. Um, expanding on that idea, um, we've embarked on a number of projects. This is a talking dictionary for Siletsdini, which is an, indig an indigenous language spoken in Oregon. It has one fluent speaker left and several other elders who, who have some grasp of the language. 
Uh, we produced this at the request of the Celestini tribe, and it's available online by password only to tribal members only. Uh, but it's the kind of resource that, again, we can do the science, we can do the documentation, but we want to do something also beneficial to the community. And these are the kind of products, storybooks, talking dictionaries. Um, I've also been developing with National Geographic and support from some of our other corporate sponsors the idea of a language technology kit where we bring in the technology, laptop computer, digital recorder, video recorder, tripod, still camera, headphones, and we train local people in the community who are already invested in the language, who are already fulfilling a role of being language activists because they can do this work much more efficiently than outsiders can. And so we're working on providing training and technologies to some of the world's smallest language communities. And they're going to do great things with this equipment and with their languages. It also doesn't apply only to small languages. So I want to talk a little bit about technology and bigger languages. Um, we've been working for about five years now in India on a language called Ho. Ho has a million speakers or more. They're kind of a diaspora, so they're spread out over several states. It's hard to get an exact count of how many speakers there are. Um, Ho is a language that has speakers of all ages, so it's not severely endangered, but it is definitely beginning to show signs of language shift. Most children are sent off to boarding schools where there are intense pressures against them using their languages. Uh, they view this as a way to get ahead, so they feel they're pressured or told that they need to give up their heritage language and speak just Hindi or English or Oriya. And, but the Ho also have an asset, which is they have intense cultural pride. They have a very, very strong language ideology. They believe that their language is, has a sacred quality to it, that it is essential to their practice of religion. They have never converted to Hinduism or Christianity or any outside religion. They practice their own traditional animistic religion, and they believe that their language is integral to that. So there are various forces working against the survival of this language, even though it's large. And there are various cultural forces that are working for uh, its survival. One of the additional complications with the Ho language is that they have one of the world's oddest alphabets. Um, and they adopted this alphabet partly because they wanted to be seen as immediately distinct from any other language. They didn't want their language to ever be confused with any other language in written form. So they have an alphabet called Warang Chiti. Uh, we've been lobbying the Unicode Consortium for five or six years now to have this alphabet accepted into Unicode. Uh, so that they can use it on computers, websites, cell phones, and so forth. This is a potential barrier to this language crossing the digital divide, but it's not insurmountable. And they are using uh, a, trans a Latin transliteration of the language. They are establishing a presence. Uh, once their alphabet's accepted into Unicode, uh, many other doors and opportunities will be open to this community. Um, so I've given you a range of scenarios, um, elderly last speakers in Siberia, um, in Paraguay, and various other places. I want to end on a slightly more optimistic note because it can be a little depressing thinking about languages going extinct. Uh, but I want to point out also that there is a very exciting grassroots global movement for language revitalization. Uh, and this is happening everywhere in the United States, in Native American communities, in Canada, in First Nations communities, um, in South America, in South Asia. All around the world, small communities are realizing essentially that they've been presented with a false choice by pressures of globalization. They've been told implicitly or explicitly, you need to give up your heritage language and speak only a global language. And this is in fact not true because uh, people can perfectly easily be bilingual. In fact, there's a large body of research coming out of psychology that shows there are cognitive benefits to being bilingual throughout the lifespan. Uh, things like uh, you have a greater uh, what's called cognitive reserve, ability to do certain types of cognitive tasks are done better by bilingual speakers. There's a later, less uh, um, likelihood of getting Alzheimer's in old age if you've been bilingual throughout your lifespan. So there are all kinds of cognitive benefits to being bilingual. People are beginning to realize that they can keep their language and they can also speak a global language. So I want to personify that trend uh, by talking about this young man. His name is Sange Nimasau. He lives in the extreme northeast of India. Um, 
He doesn't look like this every day. This is occasional ceremonial dress. On a daily basis, he looks like this. Um, he has a cell phone. He rides a motorcycle. He owns a billiards parlor. He is a thoroughly connected global citizen. He uses the internet. He sends text messages. He and his friends speak five languages. They speak um, Nepali, Assamese, Hindi, English, and they speak Akka, which is their own native language. Akka is a very endangered language. It has probably fewer than a thousand speakers. Very hard to find speakers under the age of 20 in this language. And Sange and his friend have come up with what I think is highly likely to succeed, um, a unique strategy for saving their language. So I just want you to hear it in their own words. This is how they're going to save their endangered language. Asampa sampa lupani chaina for futu futanya for me in your futanya gijiri in the piara in the hot jar. Asanka sanka lupani chaina for futu futanya for me in your futanya gijiri in the piara in the hot jar. Ane na le boda jimeve. Ane ane ah ane na le boda jimeve. So that's hip hop performed in Akka, a language with fewer than a thousand speakers, severely endangered. It's a little song about hot chili peppers and romance, uh, which I was able to translate with their help. What's the use of this? Why would these two young men who are entrepreneurs, they're businessmen, they're multilingual, they're educated, they're globally connected. Why would they choose to hang on to a language that has absolutely no socioeconomic value outside of the, the remote mountain villages where they come from? I can only explain this by saying it's, it's a strategic choice. It's integral to their identity. It's part of their cultural pride, who they are. And they feel very strongly and passionately, not only about keeping the language and speaking it, but about doing virtuoso things with it, about creating poetry, creating art. This is what's going to raise the prestige of the language. What could make a language seem cooler to five and six-year-olds who are the decision makers than hip hop, uh, which the elders kind of disapprove of? Um, this is it. This is the solution. This is how communities are saving their languages. And these are the kind of things that we can all contribute to. We can all enable these efforts. We can provide training and technology to communities like this of all different sizes all around the globe. So I want to, again, uh, close by just saying that there is a wide variety of language scenarios around the world. Most of the world's 7,000 languages not documented or recorded, not written down. Many of them, even some rather large ones, ha not having crossed the digital divide, not represented on the internet. And then there are very small languages. Um, I think we can all do something to help out. I think that linguistic diversity has a value for all of us. And I've given you some specific examples about the human knowledge base, the types of knowledge that are eroding. And uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So we can live in a world, just with a small shift of people's attitudes, we can live in a world where linguistic diversity and intellectual diversity is valued and is continued. Thank you. I would be happy to uh, open it up for questions and discussion. And thanks again for hosting me here at Microsoft. Yes. So this might work because they do have a lot of speakers already. Was, is there any some sort of critical mass that you think there is that you have to have certain right. mass of speakers, otherwise you're going to just go down? Is there a critical mass of speakers you need? Uh, well, with respect to Akka, um, I don't, they're well under 1,000. It's a small number. 600 is not very many. 600, 800, maybe 1,000, generously estimating. Um, that's less than half of the population of their ethnic group. Uh, and it's well below the median number of speakers for a world language, which is around 3,000. So, um, but your question is, is certainly valid. Is there a critical mass, a certain number you need? Yes, but it depends on the circumstances. If you have 400 speakers of a language, but they all live on one island, and they don't live inter intermingled with anyone else, the language could be perfectly stable with that number of speakers. 
Conversely, you could have a rather large language like Navajo, which has something like 50,000 speakers, but the transmission rates are extremely low. Uh, by one report, they're below 20%. So a, lang a language with relatively large numbers can crash rather suddenly given the right types of pressures, and conversely, a language with small numbers can sustain itself for a long time. So we don't know yet exactly what the mix of factors is that causes some languages to be resilient. It's demographic factors, it's geographic factors, but it's also a lot of intangibles. It's ideologies and attitudes and daily micro decisions made by people about how and when to use their language. Have I had any experience with secrecy or people who don't want to disclose their languages? Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, people own their languages. And the sense of ownership increases in proportion, in reverse proportion to the size of the community. So when you're dealing with a very small community, they have a heightened sense of ownership, of intellectual property, and they share what they want to share, what they choose to share. So that's, and in many cases, that's still more than we could even assimilate or understand. So um, that doesn't worry me as a linguist. Um, I found people to be generally very generous in what they're willing to share of their languages. But of course, there are domains of knowledge that are secret, and that's how it should be. Yes, if I could take a question from the back. Can you talk more about the language technology kit that you mentioned, where you send how much of a linguist time or someone, do you have to train a local person and then they can take it from there? Yeah, the language technology kit is much more than just a kit. It also involves people and training. So we put together the basic tools that someone needs to do a documentation of a language. Um, we go in ourselves. We identify the right person to give the kit to. So we look for somebody who's a language activist who's already doing something to preserve or maintain the language. Maybe they're recording the elders' stories or they're collecting botanical knowledge. We identify that person. We give them the technology, provide them the tools. Uh, we spend time teaching them how to use it. Uh, we send in a graduate student within one year to, who serves as an apprentice to the community, so we raise funding to send that person in. Uh, we do a follow-up visit, and now we've begun bringing those individuals back to a central location, either in the U.S. or centrally somewhere in their own country, where we provide uh, workshops and training for them to, to keep doing the work. So it's a long-term engagement that we strive for with a community like this. Um, maintaining a language is a long-term effort and the technologies are evolving so since we started giving out the technology kits things have gotten much smaller and more portable so there's actually we are benefiting from downsizing in in technology and again I would emphasize that technology won't save a language uh, but it does contribute to the prestige of a language when people see their language for the first time in a very high-tech medium where it has never previously been seen by them or heard by them this can have a very powerful effect. Um, we've just built a talking dictionary for a language called Panao, which is spoken in, in one village in Papua New Guinea. The village has a population of about 600 people. Um, you could literally walk into the center of the village and shout something out, and every single speaker of the language would hear you. It's a dense network, uh, but it's threatened. It's endangered. And so we've created a talking dictionary for this language. The village just got electricity about three months ago, and because they live on a coastal highway, they expect to have internet within a year. And so I can't wait to see what's going to happen when those children go on the internet for the first time and they see their own language represented on the internet. I think that will send a very powerful validating message about the fact that their language is suitable for modernity. It's suitable for technology. Yes? Is it harder or easier to try and preserve a language in an area like here in the Northwest that you said was one of the hot spots? Where, so there, there is so much technology already. Does that make it easier to do because there's an infrastructure or harder because it depends all speak English? Yeah, languages, you know, technology is, is what you make of it. It's neither a help nor a hindrance, it, potentially both. Um, it's all about language attitudes. And the Northwest hotspot, uh, which includes Northern California, Washington, Oregon, contains some of the most endangered languages in North America, many of them down to the low single digits of speakers. And so, 
you know, it's going to take immense efforts um, to document them, and the chances of them being revitalized are not great. It doesn't mean that the different groups aren't making efforts, but um, so isolation can be helpful for the survival of a language. Um, acculturation can be harmful, but there are always exceptional cases. There are cases uh, I've seen where a community is completely surrounded by a dominant culture on all sides, but they still hang on to their language. So we don't yet know what the exact combination of attitudes and technologies are that cause languages to survive. I uh, had a couple of questions about Kalawaya. It's an interesting case, I mean, from the movie yesterday, and then also you brought it up today. Uh, it's not transmitted to children, so you basically, uh, um, it's transmitted uh, you know, from, from an elder to a, an apprentice, I guess. Right. Um, what's, uh, there, so the two questions are, what's the degree of fluency? Because it's not, yep. uh, it's not changing in the way that languages would normally change, but also because there's prestige associated with this language, uh, it seems to have withstood the, uh, the uh, ravages of, of external cultures That's right. uh, and external languages. Is that a, uh, a case where prestige might actually, if you can encapsulate prestige in some way, maybe that's a, that's a good example of, of language preservation? Y yes, Kalawaya is unusual on several counts. One is it's small, it's got about 100 speakers, but it seems to be extremely resilient. And we think it's because it's connected to their livelihood. So the practice, the medicinal practice, they have clients that come to them from far and wide seeking these services. And so there's a strong economic incentive to maintain the, the pharmacological knowledge base and deploy it and to keep it secret. Um, you pointed out that it's nobody's first language, and that's correct. Uh, children don't learn it from infancy. Young men learn it when they're in their early teens. So that raises a couple of questions. Is it really a full-fledged language? Can you say anything in it? And this hadn't previously been reported in the scientific literature. Most of the literature that existed emphasized the secretive nature of it, which there, it certainly is secretive, and the fact that it was there to encode medicinal knowledge as its primary function. What we found out when we sat down with speakers was that once they realized that we weren't after the secret medicinal knowledge, they were perfectly happy to give us sentences in the language. And it is a language in which you can just make up any kind of sentence. You can say, I saw two dogs fighting in the street yesterday. And those type of sentences hadn't previously been reported or collected. So uh, I don't know if that rises to a level of full fluency, but it certainly is a language in which you can have casual conversations about almost any topic, I would imagine. Children could conceivably learn it then, because you are having conversations. So they could learn it. Slow. Children could learn it. Um, during the rituals, it's mumbled, so there's not really an opportunity for it. When children are, are taught the language, it's done very formally. They're brought to a place and they're sat down and they're taught the language. And another thing that hadn't been reported in the literature was that, that any women spoke the language and we strongly suspect that there are some women in the community who also speak the language. So there's much more to Kalawaya than meets the eye. It really merits um, a deep study. And um, you know, we've been trying to uh, encourage and recruit people who would go and work on Kalawaya. Yes. Um, what you're saying suggests that uh, you know, most of the effort through the uh, preservation of these languages uh, it's not like uh, most of the effort needs to come from uh, the communities themselves. But I'm just wondering, is there anything that um, um, governments surrounding populations, individuals can do to help the preservation of uh, native languages? Yeah, I, I agree completely, and that's the point I wanted to make, is that only the people who own a language can save it. Um, outsiders can support in various ways. They can provide training, technology, um, encouragement, um, and, and governments can do that, but NGOs can also do it, nonprofits, private individuals. Um, there are all kinds of efforts out there, and I would want to encourage all of them. You know, um, some of the work is done by missionaries, by Bible translators, uh, people who are um, coming in as NGOs. Uh, organizations like that can also do harm to a language, though, if they're bringing in uh, an ideology that says that Spanish is better or English is better, then they could actually participate in the demise of the language. So, you know, part of my job is to just make people aware at all levels, the NGOs, the government ministries, whatever level, um, the, through the media, that we should all value linguistic diversity. Yes, Manuela. Yes, the most frequent languages correlates to speaking numbers. Yes. 
Why was 83 like 20 million speakers? Oh, you know, 83 was kind of an arbitrary. I was looking for approximately which languages map onto the top 20%. And so I took ethnologue data and I just put it in a big spreadsheet. And it's kind of an arbitrary cutoff point. I could say the top 100 languages. Um, Yes, uh, I would. I would be happy to pull my list of 84. Uh, there, there may be one or two, but you know, again, I want to. I want to commend uh, you and your whole team here. I mean, I think the language uh, localization that you're doing with the local languages program is really something very powerful. And um, frankly, I feel like it hasn't gotten enough attention, both within and outside the company, for the the social good that it's doing. Uh, you know, it's it's really very powerful. And the fact that you've gone significantly down the list. You haven't just stayed in the top 83, but you've chosen languages that are small and in some cases endangered. Um, Maori, Welsh, Irish, Inuktitut, you know, those are really, I think, important choices. And those middle tier communities, not the extreme endangered ones and not the big ones, but the middle tier are the ones where timely intervention can have the most positive effect and technology can have the most positive effect. They're not too far gone, um, but they're definitely beginning to be endangered. That's right. How do you choose the right set of middle tier languages? You promised to help us, right? I I'm look, forward to, uh, look forward to working with you on choosing the next hundred set of languages for, uh, for Windows. Yeah. Yes? Have I reached out to the United Nations? Um, indirectly, I'm, I'm in contact with various individuals. Uh, I think the, um, the UN Permanent Forum of Indigenous Peoples is a very important venue for this uh, because they're the ones who speak most of the endangered languages. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've written a couple books on this topic. I send the copies of those to people. I've written op-ed pieces. Uh, I've tried to do general uh, consciousness raising. Uh, UNESCO, um, of all the UN organizations that might take an interest, UNESCO is the most likely, and they indeed have taken a strong interest in this. They don't have a lot of funding for it, uh, but they've definitely um, they've published an atlas of the world's endangered languages, um, and they've done some other activities that, that promote the status of minority and endangered languages. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate the opportunity, and I'll stick around if people want to talk to me. Thanks.